from the 2014 test. Um, we're looking for a positive value of k for which the y-intercept of l is one half. And we are given that l is tangent to y equals e to the x at the point k comma e to the k. So um, first, let's see if we can write the equation of line l so that we can figure out this y-intercept. So in order to write the equation of line l, we need both the point, so we know the point, and we need a slope. Well, what's the slope? It's the derivative of our function, right? And if we're taking the derivative of our function and then we are evaluating it at k, that should give us a slope of e to the k. So we have a point of k comma e to the k and we have a slope of e to the k. So we should write y minus e to the k equals slope e to the k times x minus k. Everybody good with that being the equation of the line tangent to e to the x at k e to the k? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> We want the y-intercept of this to be one half. Well, the y-intercept is zero, one half, right? So that means that when x is zero, y needs to be one half. So one half minus e to the k equals e to the k times zero minus k. Uh, or you know, one half minus e to the k equals negative k e to the k. And so all you would do then here with this is you would graph each of these equations. And let me quickly here go into Desmos. We've got one half. Uh, let me show this. One half minus e to the x, right? We're just going to graph them as x's. And then we have negative x e to the x. Is that right? And we're looking for the positive, that's specifically what it said in the problem, the positive value of k. So that positive value there looks like it is 0.768, where those two things are equal to each other. And if this was a free response question on the AP test, you'd want to make sure that you wrote out this full equation, and then you could just use your graphing calculator, solve it, and put the answer. Everybody good there with number 86? Any questions there? It's all good. Cool. All right, I think that's the only one anybody asked for from 2014. So let's look at 2015. Uh, we'll start with the multiple choice and then we'll move through a couple of the three spots. Uh, looks like we will start with Number five. <clears throat> so here we go. Number five. Says We've got this function f of x. It's a piecewise defined function. We want to know what values of c make this continuous at x equals 2. So for a function to be continuous at a point, three criteria have to be met. One is that f of c exists. One is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. And two is that those two things are equal. Well, the limit as x approaches c from the right should be the same as f of, um, yeah, I, I shouldn't be, I guess I shouldn't be using c. Let's use a, we'll call a, um, a equals two. So I'm not going to use c because they already use c in there. Normally, we need f of two to exist. 
and we need the limit as x approaches two of f of x to exist, and we need those two things to be equal to each other. So f of two is the same as the limit as x approaches two from the right, but we also need the limit as x approaches two from the left to equal that. So we need to find the limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x and set it equal to the limit as x approaches two from the right of f of x. And then see when that's true, because anytime that that is true is when this limit exists. And if that limit exists, it will be equal to f of two because that limit should come straight from this. So as x approaches two from the left, we're looking at x squared sine pi x or two squared sine two pi. And as we approach f or we approach uh, two from the right, it should be two squared plus two c minus 18. And we're then looking at sine of two pi, which is zero. And we have four minus the 18 is negative 14 plus two c. And it looks like if we solve that, we get c equals seven. So c equals seven is the singular value of c that will make that true. Good or not? Any questions on that? Right. Next one that we will look at will be number eight. Hopefully. All right, number eight. I wanted yeah, eight. Okay. Uh, we are looking for which of these um, values is the limit as x approaches infinity of g of x. So we have an initial condition that g of negative two is negative one. And so if g of negative two is negative one. We'll go to that point. So negative two is about here and negative one is about here. So we're looking at the solution curve that goes through this point. So as we, and we're looking at it as it goes towards infinity. So as it goes towards infinity, we should note that all along, even though you can't see them, all along that x-axis, anytime when y is equal to zero, this dy dx, should be equal to zero, right? Zero, this is zero times four, which is zero. And so we should be approaching a horizontal asymptote here of y equals zero, which means that as x goes towards infinity, g of x should be approaching zero. Good or no? All right, next one will be 12. And I think 13 also is on the list. So we'll just put, we'll put both of those in here right now. Look at that, all right, 12 and 13. So for number 12, we're looking for the average rate of change so this is important, not the average value, but average rate of change is just the slope. So this one's not even a calculus question. They just put that in there to make sure you're reading and know what average rate of change means. Average rate of change is just the slope of this function on the interval zero to pi over two. So that'll be cosine of two times pi over two minus cosine of two times zero over pi over two minus zero. And the cosine of two times pi over two, that's the cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative one minus the cosine of zero, which is one all over pi over two. And we end up with negative two 
over pi over two, which is negative four over pi. Any questions there on number 12? Next one should be number 13 there. So this one is just an implicit differentiation problem. Derivative of y cubed with respect to x is 3y squared dy dx. The derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. And the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x. So we've now got dy dx, if I factor out that from there, times 3y squared plus 1 equals 2x, or we end up with 2x over 3y squared plus 1. Choice E. Any questions there on that one? All right, next one will be 17. All right, so 17, we got velocity in meters per second of a wave is this, and where h is the depth, and we're looking for the rate of change the velocity with respect to the depth. So we were we are looking for dv, the rate of change of velocity with respect to the depth h. So we're looking for dv dh, um, which just means that we need to take the derivative of 3 root h with respect to h. So that should be, well, it's just 3 times the derivative of root h, which is 1 over 2 root h. And it asks us, what is this when h is 2? It should be 3 over 2 root 2. Any questions there on that one? Everyone's good there? OK. Next one we'll do is 23. All right, so for 23, we want to know the tangent line to this when x is negative 1. So to find the tangent line, we first need a point, and we also need um, we also need a slope. So to find the point, we just need to figure out what is y evaluated at negative 1. Well, that should be 3 minus the integral from negative 1 to negative 1 of e to the negative t cubed dt. Well, the integral from negative 1 to negative 1 of anything is just zero, so that should be three. Everybody good there with the point being negative one comma three? Hopefully. And then we need to find the derivative, so y prime, well, the derivative of three, that's just the derivative of a constant, that's zero. So it should be negative, the coefficient out in front of this. And then this is just the integral from a constant to x of a function, and the derivative of the integral from a constant to x of a function is just that function in terms of x. So y prime is negative e to the negative x cubed. And when x equals negative 1, that ought to be negative e to the well, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, and it's negative negative 1. So that should be e to the positive 1, or just negative e. So our equation ought to be y minus y1 equals slope times x minus negative 1, or x plus 1. 
line minus three equals negative e times x plus one. If the integral went from negative one to two x, would you have to put a two in front of the negative e to the negative x cubed? Um, yes, you would, as well as you would have to, you'd replace, you wouldn't put in just an x in here, you'd do negative two x cubed. Okay. Yes, but yes, correct. You would also have a two out Everybody good there? You said there would also be a two out in front. Correct. Yep. If there was a two X in the top of that angle. Oh, okay. Everybody good there now? All right, next one we'll look at here is 24. <clears throat> for 24, we are looking for the solution to the differential equation. This is a separable differential equation. So we'll do dy over y squared equals five dx. Multiply by the dx, divide by the y squared. And we'll integrate both sides. So the integral of dy over y squared is not this. This is a very common mistake. That is not the integral. You know, let me write this as the integral of y to the negative two dy and integrate that. It's so negative one over y. It's negative one y to the negative one. And this side becomes five x plus your constant. When x is zero, y is three. So we end up with a constant of negative one third. So we've got negative one over y equals five x minus a third. And just based on how some of these look, it seems like we're gonna need to get a common denominator here. So let's multiply by three to the top and bottom to make that 15 x over three. And when we take the reciprocal now to get negative y, we have three over 15 x minus one. And you divide by the negative, means you can distribute that negative through the 15 x minus one to make it positive one and a minus 15 x, which is choice D. Any questions there on that one? Um, so somebody's asking about implicit differentiation. Implicit differentiation is only for taking derivatives. It doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with integrals. Um, so this is this is a separable differential equation where we get the different variables on each side and then we integrate both sides. Um, but yeah, for implicit differentiation, like on the, no, not this one, uh, not this one, this one, number 13. Um, you're always taking the derivative of both sides um, with respect to x or maybe with t or who knows what it might be. But um, yeah, implicit differentiation doesn't really have anything to do with integrals. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Let's see, 24, right? Was that one? What's next? Twenty eight. <clears throat> I swear we've done this one. I don't know. I feel like I've done this one at least twice. I feel like we did this one in this class, but maybe I've just done it twice in given three for some reason. Who knows? We've got a ladder here that's resting against a vertical wall. Um, that is our ladder, and it's sliding down the wall. And it's sliding down the wall at a rate of two feet per second. So I'm gonna draw a different picture here because their picture is just too fancy and nice. Um, I'm gonna call this X, I'm gonna call this Y. 
I'm going to call this 15. I'm not going to call it Z. Even though this is a related rate, I can put that value in. Normally, we don't put down any values, um, but this value is not changing. The latter is 15 feet. It's not getting bigger or smaller as it slides. It's still 15 feet. But X and Y are both changing. In fact, Y is changing at a rate of two feet per second. It's sliding down, which means Y is getting smaller, which means that rate of change should be negative, so negative two feet per second. Um, we are interested in at what rate this angle, we'll call it theta, is changing, which means we need to somehow relate theta to the other variables on here. So we're going to use a trig function to do that. Um, and we are given the fact that x is equal to 9. And since we have dy dt, it seems best to relate theta to y and the 15 that we already know. So that should be sine of theta equals y over 15. And if I were to take the derivative of both sides of this, because it's a related rate problem with respect to t, that ought to give me cosine theta d theta dt equals 1 15th dy dt. And all we need to then know is what is the cosine of theta? Because we have dy dt and we're looking for d theta dt. So well, cosine of theta ought to be x over 15, right? So all we need to do is put in our x value, 9, 9 over 15. We get 9 fifteenths d theta dt is equal to, and we put in the negative 2 for dy dt, negative 2 fifteenths. And we should be able to cancel out the over 15 by multiplying both sides by 15. And we end up with d theta dt is negative 2 ninths. Any questions there on that one? All right, let's see here. Um, somebody was now asking about the free response. Uh, let's see, one C and D from the free response. Let me go find those real quick. Real quick. I said real quick, but I'm not, not actually being real quick about it. <clears throat> All right, so. Here's one. There's a picture for it. And then we need C and D. C. And D. So we got this nice little graph here. It's piecewise linear, which is nice to know. It means all these pieces are linear. Um, and um, at the initial time, the tank has 100 liters of water. And R of T, this graph, is the rate at which water is being pumped into the tank during 55-minute period. Um, so we've got at T equals 10 minutes, water begins draining from the tank at a rate modeled by the function D, which they give us there. Um, we want to know how many liters of water are in the tank at t equals 55 minutes. So in order to figure that out, we first need to take a look at our initial condition. It starts with 100. We need to add to it the amount that is pumped into the tank, which should be the integral from 0 to 55 of r of t. And we need to subtract the amount that drains from the tank between t equals 10 and t equals 55. So minus the integral from 10 to 55 of d of t dt. And so we end up with 100 plus, and then we need to find this integral. Well, that was horribly drawn, but we'll divide this into three little pieces here. 
Um, the first piece is a trapezoid, the last piece is a triangle, and the middle piece is a rectangle. So trapezoid should be base one plus base two divided by two times the height, which is 20. And then the rectangle is 15 by 30. And the triangle there is one half of, let's see, what is that? 30 and 20. And then we'll subtract this value that we'll get from our calculator. Um, so I don't, I don't know offhand what that is. Let's see here. Let me I can just pull up the guide scoring guideline on it. Give me just give me one second here. And I will tell you what that value is. Looks like that value was 799.725. Okay, seven nine point seven two five, um, and it is liters. And just for your reference, I, I know it says it in in here, but that was worth three points: one for the integral, one for the amount of water um, in the tank at the beginning, the hundred, and then one for the final answer. So, good. Yep. All right. And then for part D, use R and D to determine whether the amount of water in the tank is increasing or decreasing. Well, it just depends on what R of 45 is, because that's the rate at which it's pumping in. And D of 45, um, R of 45, if this is linear, well, let's see. This thing went from 30 to zero across 20 units. So after 10 units, it should have dropped to 15. So R of 45 ought to be 15. And D of 45, um, I couldn't tell you what 10 times E to the sine of 45 divided by 10 is, but this, this thing will, let's see, let me see here, go back there, 10.881, uh, 10 10.88815. And since R of 45 is greater then D of 45, the amount that it's being pumped in is larger than the amount that it's draining out, which means that it should be increasing. Because R of 45 is greater than D of 45. Does that make sense or no? Yeah? Any questions there on that one? All right. 